Good afternoon. Let me also, on behalf of RSIS, welcome everyone to the Distinguished Public Lecture. And I am indeed honored, and I take pleasure in introducing um, our guest speaker today, who will talk about a very interesting topic, <clears throat> Australia's role in the Indo-Pacific. Um, some of you who have been following the news would know that uh, we had a very big event this week, uh, the Australia and ASEAN Summit um, that celebrated 50 years of bilateral relations was just held. And there were a lot of interesting things that came out of that bilateral uh, discussion, and I'm sure Professor Wesley will be speaking about that. Anyway, <clears throat> let me introduce Professor Michael Wesley, who is Deputy Vice Chancellor um, Glo of Global Culture and Engagement at the University of Melbourne. He provides overall responsibility for strategic guidance and expert advice on internationalization and global engagement. Professor Wesley is also Professor of Politics at the University of Melbourne, and he works and writes on Australian foreign policy and the international affairs of Asia and the Pacific. Before joining the University of Melbourne, Professor Wesley was Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific at the Australian National University. Professor Wesley is not only a well-known academic, for, for many of us that follow international relations, both in the Asia and Pacific, we know that Professor Wesley has been uh, writing a lot about um, affairs about in the Indo-Pacific. He was quite famous for his work on the Asia-Pacific community and Asian regionalism. So he straddles both the academic and the think tank and the policy community. He held positions as the executive director of the Lowy Institute for International Policy. He was the director of the, director of the Griffith Asia Institute at Griffith University and assistant director general for transnational issues at the Office of National Assessments. We will have um, time to ask uh, Professor Wesley some questions about the, uh, the, uh, the issues that are now uh, dotting the Asia-Pacific landscape. But in the meantime, let me now invite Professor Wesley to deliver his public lecture. Michael, please. Um, Ambassador Ong and to uh, the staff of um, RSIS, thank you uh, sincerely for your invitation to visit Singapore for uh, for a week. Uh, I never need very much encouragement to come to Singapore. I have many friends here, including Melly, who I've known for many years. Um, and I must say, I always uh, find my visits to Singapore to be most informative about what's going on in the region. I was speaking to the Singaporean High Commissioner to Australia uh, just last Friday, and uh, he was giving me suggestions about who I might go and see. The title of this lecture was suggested by RSIS, and I would like to begin by thanking my hosts for, do, for suggesting this title, because it really made me think. According to my dictionary, the word role has two meanings. First, to, to define the part or character played by an actor, and second, a proper or customary function in society. The first of these senses suggests an inside-out process of role-playing, the character and attitude that an actor wants to present to others. The second sense suggests an outside-in view, the function that others expect and perceive an actor to be playing in society. This seems to me to be a very good way to rethink the history and dynamics of Australia's interactions with its neighbours in Asia and the Pacific. To my mind, both of these aspects of roles, how we want to be seen by others and how others see us, are both questions of identity. Identity informs our character, our interests and our motives in interacting with others, while others' perceptions of our actions inform their understanding of our own identity and motives. 
I want to suggest today that for states as for people, identity is informed by a process of association and dissociation as we interact with others. States, like people, develop a sense of identity through emphasising their similarities to some others and their differences from others. These similarities and differences can be geographic, cultural, ideological, societal, developmental or religious. It is which similarities and differences a nation chooses to emphasise that forms national identity. But national identities can also be contested. Different groups in society can choose to emphasise different similarities and differences with others. Australia's peoples were interacting with the peoples of Asia and the Pacific for centuries before the arrival of the British in 1788. Relationships of trade and cultural exchange were well developed between Makassan seafarers and the Yolnu people of Arnhem Land, as were relations between Torres Strait Islanders and the peoples of the Mel Melanesian archipelago. In Australia, however, there was and has been no colonisation, uh, decolonisation, should I say, as there was for the other societies of Asia and the Pacific. Decolonisation was a process of gaining control of the state by the original inhabitants and the assertion of their national identities formed over centuries of interaction with neighbouring societies. This never occurred in Australia. Australia, after 1788, was taken over by peoples whose identities had been formed elsewhere on two cold, wet, rocky islands on the other side of the world, of the coast of Europe. The people who settled Australia after 1788 brought with them cultural memories of centuries of warfare and religious conflict, of a society rigidly stratified by class, of an economy transformed by the invention of, the in of industrial processes of a rural lifestyle ripped away by the acts of enclosure and the rapid urbanisation of new industrial cities, of desperate filth, poverty and crime. These were not the memories of neighbouring societies in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, which had been two of the world's great maritime trading systems before the arrival of Europeans. The British arrived in Australia at the dawn of what historians have called the Second Age of Empire. The First Age of Empire had begun with Vasco da Gama and involved establishing trading posts in Asia and Africa and settling European populations in the Americas. The Second Age of Empire involved annexing whole countries for their economic wealth and strategic advantage, eventually leading to almost all of the, the Earth's land surface being controlled by European powers. It was a situation that relied on European superiority in weaponry, military and political organisation and maritime technology. But what is less commonly acknowledged was the role that ideology played in European powers' conquest of the rest of the world. Military and industrial superiority fed ideas of racial and religious superiority, fueled later in the 19th century by the publication of Charles Darwin's Ascent of Man. The colonisers carried with them a firm conviction that humanity was divided into a hierarchy of races and that the superiority of Europeans over non-Europeans not only justified but obliged them to rule other societies. If Europeans thought they were superior to non-Europeans, the British believed they were superior to all others, European and non-European. They pointed to Britain's superiority to other nations in their parliamentary institutions, science and technology, philosophy, industrial production and, and military and naval power as proof that, to quote Cecil Rhodes, <clears throat> 
to be born British is to win first prize in the lottery of life. Unsurprisingly then, the British who came to Australia carried with them an intense pride and identification with Britain and its institutions. The intensity of this identification with the assumed apex of human civilization was matched by the intensity of their disidentification with the indigenous peoples of Australia and explains the br brutality of the dispossession of their lands. British Australians' de-identification also extended to the peoples of Asia and the Pacific, who were automatically categorised as inferior. The first act of the Australian Parliament in 1901 was the Immigration Restriction Act, which became known as the White Australia Policy. It aimed to keep coloured people out of Australia because it was assumed they would pour in if allowed and undermine white men's wages. This identity as an outpost of British civilisation shaped Australia's actions in Asia and the Pacific for nearly three quarters of the 20th century. Australian troops contributed to the suppression of the Boxer Rebellion in Beijing in 1901 as part of the Imperial Powers Expedition. Australia became a colonial power in 1905 when it assumed responsibility for the former British colony of New Guinea and extended this colony in the First World War by seizing the German territory of Papua. At the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919, Australia's Prime Minister Billy Hughes argued forcefully against Japan's proposal to insert a racial equality clause in the peace agreement. With the rapid decolonisation of Asia after the Second World War, Australia saw its world transformed. Leaders such as Nehru and Sukarno came out of their country's independent struggles with a powerful sense of post-colonial nationalism and pan-Asian solidarity. It was a significant inflection point for Australia. Would Australia see itself as a post-colonial society with significant commonalities and sympathies with its post-colonial neighbours or not? The answer, at least initially, was not. Australia instead chose to see Asian nationalism and post-colonial solidarity through a Cold War lens. Its identity broadened past Britain to embrace the United States and eventually the collective West. Australia came to see its role in Asia as one of helping to ensure that the spread of communism was stopped in its tracks and that non-alignment didn't turn into anti-Western hostility. As it signed ANZUS, joined CETO and sent troops to fight alongside the British in Malaya and the Americans in Korea and Vietnam, Australia found itself frequently diplomatically estranged, estranged from the positions of many Asian countries. The adoption of a non-aligned stance by many of Australia's neighbours followed from their anti-colonialism and was at odds with Australia's alliance with the United States. Some Australian leaders viewed non-alignment as at best naive and at worst a form of crypto-communism. It is hard to imagine that many in Asia came to see Australia as other than a stubborn holdout for a dying imperial order. While some Asian leaders, such as Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew, would later defend the Vietnam War as having held communism at bay for long enough for the rest of Southeast Asia to stabilise and develop, Many others remained sceptical of Australia's alliance-driven interventions in Southeast Asia. But Australia's racialised imperial identity, while dominant, had never been completely uncontested. In the decades after the arrival of the First Fleet, there began to emerge in Australian society the need for a distinct identity that was not British. <coughs> This manifested most strongly in emancipated convicts, people born in Australia 
and Irish Republican convicts who began to emphasise social attributes that were the opposite of those in British society. Instead of class hierarchies, radical egalitarianism. Instead of a Tory Whig political aristocracy, miners and workers movements. A strong Catholic solidarity against the Protestant ascendancy, an idealised image of the frontier settler. What this counter-identity lacked, however, was a compelling, compelling alternative to Britishness with which to identify. While some identified with Ireland's independence struggle and workers' movements in Europe, these were too far away to be strong identifiers. After the First World War, the rise of internationalism in Western societies provided another point of identification, though still relatively weak. Internationalists believed in building multilateral institutions and popular internationalist movements to counter the warmongering of imperial states. This nascent counter-identity led to bitterly fought debates over conscription during the First World War and the ultimate defeat of two conscription referenda. It led, just after the Second World War, to trade unions picketing Dutch ships in Australian uh, ports in support of Indonesian independence. Australia's external world by the 1950s was changing in ways that challenged its cultural imperial identity. Asia's decolonisation and the threat of communism in its new states began to seed the realisation that Australia's future would be in a region of independent states with cultures, languages and levels of development very different from Australia's. There was a growing discomfort in Australia with the incongruity of maintaining a racially restrictive immigration policy in a region of non-white peoples. The beginnings of a serious campaign to dismantle the white Australia policy developed from the mid-1950s, even as the arrival of thousands of students from South and Southeast Asia to study at Australia's schools and universities began to shift Australians' racial attitudes. As Britain edged towards joining the EEC, Australia's trade with Japan boomed, and soon after it boomed with other Asian tiger economies. On Australia's streets and campuses by the 1960s, a new generation demonstrated against central tenets of the old Australian identity. Patriarchy, the war in Vietnam, the marginalisation of Indigenous Australians, apartheid. <coughs> Excuse me. Between 1966 and 1973, the White Australia policy was relaxed and then repu repudiated. An Australian dollar replaced the imperial pound. A new national anthem, Advance Australia Fair, replaced God Save the Queen. A new defence policy focused on continental defence rather than expeditionary interventions became increasingly refined. During the 1970s and 1980s, the old assumed hierarchies between Australia and its Asian neighbours was completely upended. Australia, along with the rest of the Western world, succumbed to economic recession, high unemployment, sagging product productivity, industrial unrest and economic volatility. Meanwhile, Asia was booming with country after country following Japan down the path of rapid industrialisation, strong export growth, new innovations in design and production, low unemployment and stable industrial relations. Asia shifted from a place of perceived inferiority in the Australian mind to a region to be emulated and integrated with. Here was the identification that the counter-narrative had been looking for, a regional destiny, the reckoning of a transplanted society with the cultures around it. 
In 1973, Australia established diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, North Vietnam and North Korea and precipitated perhaps the greatest crisis in its alliance with the United States by strongly criticising the Christmas bombing campaign of North Vietnam. In 1974, a year after the dismantling of the White Australia policy, Australia became ASEAN's first external dialogue partner. Australia's liberalising economic reforms of the 1980s and 1990s were pursued with a sense of existential crisis. In then Pr Treasurer Paul Keating's words, quote, if this government cannot get the adjustment it needs, the manufacturing going again and keep moderate wage outcomes and a sensible economic policy, then Australia is basically done for. We will end up a third rate economy, a banana republic. Australia risked being left behind as its neighbours to the north streaked ahead. It helped that the Cold War in Asia went into recession with China's economic opening and normalisation of its diplomatic relations after 1978. Against a less ideological, more developmental backdrop, non-alignment and alignment became less important. In a bilateral sense, Australia began to look at ways in which it could complement the interests of its Asian neighbours, be it with minerals and energy exports to the industrialising giants of North Asia, or with defence partnerships with Southeast Asian states, such as Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia, or indeed in playing a vigorous role in trying to, to bring peace to Cambodia. Under Prime Ministers Hawke and Keating and Foreign Minister Gareth Evans, Australia began to see Australia, uh, sorry, Asia as its region, just as Britain had chosen Europe and the US had chosen North America. What became APEC was proposed by Hawke in a speech in Seoul and held its first meeting in Canberra. Australia relied on creative cartography to leave behind the legacy of its long disidentification with Asia. If its Asian credentials could be challenged, surely no one could argue that it was not part of the Asia Pacific. The inconvenient truth about this formulation was that the only Pacific countries included in it were Papua New Guinea and New Zealand. It was Prime Minister Paul Keating who embodied and epitomised Australia's new identity and ex explicitly rep repudiated the old. Keating's big picture vision combined integration with Asia, reconciliation with Indigenous Australians and becoming a republic as the basis of a new outward looking and confident Australia in Asia, the Pacific and the world. As the 1996 election approached, Keating warned, quote, if you change the government, you change the country, unquote. He was warning that, that at that election, two alternative identities and visions for Australia's role in Asia and the world were being offered. For Keating, Australia's coming of age meant leaving behind the old culturalist racialised legacy of Australia's colonisation and embracing its contemporary, localised reality and destiny. He and Evans believed that severing the last constitutional links to the British monarchy, embracing the injustices towards and marginalisation of Indigenous Australians, and embracing a new multiracial society would be seen as more authentic and more easily acceptable in Asia. Keating's opponent, John Howard, rejected this alternative identity utterly. He regarded Keating's repudiation of Australia's colonial past as an insult to what he called ordinary Australians. Howard derided what he called the black armband view of history, which highlighted injustices towards Indigenous Australians, the racism of the white Australia policy, 
and Australia's past uncritical support for British and American wars. A devout monarchist, Howard celebrated the parliamentary, legal and cultural legacies of Australia's British heritage and campaigned strongly against Australia becoming a republic. In foreign policy terms, Howard set out to demonstrate that Australia did not have to create a new identity to be accepted in Asia. He argued that viewing Asia as an undifferentiated bloc was misguided, that Asia itself was internally diverse, and so any differences that Australia might have with its neighbours were irrelevant. Howard embraced the US alliance, acting to deepen it at a time when America seemed ascendant, victorious in the Cold War, unchallenged in a unipolar world, and emerging as a laboratory to an information technology revolution that was reshaping economies and societies. Instead of race and culture, Howard spoke of values and trust as the core of Australia's Western identity. Australia's commonalities with America and to a lesser extent Europe, such as democracy, liberal values and commitments to free markets, were for Howard a defining feature for Australia and its role in the world. If these were parts of a defining identity, Howard admitted that many of the countries of Asia did not share them. But far from using difference for othering countries in Asia, Howard proposed a pragmatic workaround. He said of the Australia-China Australia relationship in 2002, quote, the relationship between Australia and China is sound because it is built upon the important principles of mutual respect for each other and a recognition that different societies that have different cultures and different histories can nevertheless work together very closely. If they understand those differences and they focus on the things that bring their two societies together. Howard acknowledged that these differences uh, existed, but suggested that formula of mutual respect. In 1998, he said, quote, of course we support a more liberal approach in all countries, but we also respect the right of countries to have the system of governance that they think is best for their society. Our relations with countries having different cultural and political traditions must be based on mutual respect. We will give them the, the same respect and acknowledgement of sovereign authority that we ask to be given to us." Unquote. The role Howard sketched out for Australia in Asia was pragmatic, forthright, unapologetic, and completely convinced that Australia was accepted by its neighbours as a force for good. His navigation of controversies with Australia's Asian neighbours over the intervention in East Timor, the invasion of Iraq, and on asylum seekers was predicated on a fundamental belief that Australia would stick to its position and eventually the politics of pragmatism would smooth things over. And usually he was right. There followed Howard's departure as Prime Minister in 2007, a series of developments whose profound effects on Australia's identity and projected role in the world are still playing out. Firstly, 15 years of turmoil in Australian government, in which there were seven changes of Prime Minister, only two of which were via elections. Secondly, the millennium boom, a period of massive demand for Australian energy and minerals, mainly from China, resulting in the largest and most sustained terms of trade boom in Australian history, leading to the hollowing out of the Australian manufacturing sector and the creation of great wealth in Australian society. Uh, third, the death of the impulse to economic reform. As the politics of what's in it for me 
took hold and in former Treasury Secretary Ken Henry's words, quote, the gains and losses are scored asymmetrically. Governments and oppositions retreated from any meaningful reform. Fourth, the steady deterioration of the Australian-China relationship from one of cordiality and strategic partnership to cold hostility, trade sanctions and unmet demands on both sides. Fifth, the United States retreat into an America first stance under Trump and only partially reversed, I would, I would argue, under Biden while simultaneously states such as China, Russia and Iran are increasingly prepared to, be bra to brazenly contest US preferences and US power. And finally, the pandemic, which increased the government role in Australia's economy and society to a, a greater extent than at any time since the Second World War while simultaneously hollowing out government capacity and public trust in government capacity. Collectively, these developments, to my mind, have sapped Australia's belief in itself, its confidence and its willingness to make hard choices. The combination of political instability, the wealth of the millennium boom and the hollowing out of government capacity have robbed Australia of a sense of becoming that has driven so much of the country's post-1788 history. I could also uh, add that the increasing polarisation of Australian society and politics is adding to this dynamic. Australia's sense of alarm about China's capabilities and intentions has become the defining lens through which it views the rest of the world, and in particular Asia and the Pacific. Much of the rhetoric of the former government, from warnings about foreign interference to calls to uphold the rules-based order, to its push for an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19, seemed to be designed to convince other countries to share Canberra's alarm about China. Australia's relations with many of its neighbours in Asia and the Pacific seem to be predicated on how best to stymie the further development of these neighbours' relations with China. Diplomatic initiatives for Australia are most intense with neighbours that share Australia's concerns about China, witness the revival of the Quad and the tightening of relations with Japan and India while Canberra seems unsure of what to do with countries that are unwilling to balance with it against China. And then there is the strategic Hail Mary pass that is the AUKUS agreement, to my mind based as much on Trump-driven driven fear that Australia will be left, to con left alone to confront China with the next America First lurch in the US as by any strategic calculus. What is significant is that Australia has not returned strongly to either the Keating era independence and belonging identity or the Howard era values and trust identity with the election of the Albanese government. I don't believe the AUKUS agreement is a lurch back to the Anglosphere. I think it's more complex than that. Quite simply, there has been no strategic framework for Australia's role in Asia and the Pacific of the sort out, outlined in Kevin Rudd's Asia Pacific Community proposal or Julia Gillard's Australia in the Asian Century white paper, both over a decade ago. My conversations with diplomats and analysts in Southeast Asia over the last three years, including those here in Singapore this past week, suggest that Australia's neighbours want Australia to get its diplomatic mojo back. Initi initiatives such as the Australia ASEAN Summit and Foreign Minister Wong's bilateral diplomacy are important, but Australian foreign policy is most compelling in my view when it is driven by a deliberate, purposeful plan 
for shaping the world around itself. I believe that many of Australia's neighbours in Asia want Australia to be pursuing collective initiatives because Canberra can often say things that governments in Southeast Asia can't say. Australia's diplomatic activism may at times irritate its neighbours. I still bear the scars of the Asia-Pacific Community Summit in 20, 2009, but I believe it has become part of what our Asian neighbours expect from us. Foreign Minister Wong has recently outlined a vision of a balance of power in the Indo-Pacific, where, to quote Minister Wong, where no country dominates and no country is dominated, unquote. It is a compelling vision, but in my view, it lacks a roadmap for getting there. History shows that unmediated power balances can tip quickly into either conflict or spheres of influence unless they are carefully curated and carefully buttressed. Developing a roadmap for how to get there requires deep dialogue with Australia's regional neighbours, some of which have similar hopes to Australia, while others have different visions. Developing a roadmap needs clear-eyed understanding of what could, go, what could go wrong amidst frenetic military and technology competition and how to de-escalate and challenge this into stabilising tracks. Developing a roadmap requires critical scrutiny of the existing regional architecture, asking if institutions built in previous decades are capable of contributing to solving the dilemmas in the decades ahead. And it requires closer understanding and listening to Australia's neighbours, all of which draw upon centuries old traditions of statecraft in dealing with the rise and fall of powerful empires in this part of the world. I'm confident that there is a new identity under construction in Australia, which draws on a major and ongoing change to Australian society since 1973. The growing number of Australians with heritage from and ongoing ties to the societies of Asia and the Pacific. Australian society has changed quickly and out of, out of mind and with very little uh, tension or conflict in the 50 years since 1973. It is a change that is manifest in our foreign minister, uh, born in Malaysia of Chinese uh, parents uh, and brought up in Australia, who represents a society in which over 50% of Australians were either born overseas or have at least one foreign-born parent. The new Australian identity, I believe, will be more of the region and more reconciled with its Indigenous people. These are changes that are inevitable. And I'm confident it will underpin a new, more confident and more pur purposeful role in Asia and the Pacific for Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. But uh, first, let me thank Michael for a very refreshing to the force of the, diff the journey of, a, of the way Australia has constituted and reconstituted its identity. It's refreshing because when you have lectures from uh, guest speakers in, in, in our part of the world and we talk about powers, major powers, it's always about you know, military power and all that. And for those of us who are constructivists in the room, you would be welcome. The, uh, <coughs> you know, the framework of how identity actually shapes foreign policy, identity shapes interest. And some of the things that you have mentioned when you talk about uh, being part of the neighbor, working together, listening, is music to the ears of many of us in the region have always thought that I, Australia is somehow a bit unsure about what its identity really is. So thank you for that. Uh, we now have about 45 minutes and we welcome questions from the floor.
I would encourage you to keep your questions short so that we can give others a chance also to raise their own questions. So the floor is now open. Uh, please raise your hands and I will recognize you. Anyone? Yes. Hang on, Louis, there's a microphone. Uh, thank you. I am uh, with the uh, Non-Traditional Security Studies uh, Center. And, um, at you RSIS. At RSIS. And um, my question is on the roadmap that you mentioned towards uh, a balance of power in Asia Pacific. Uh, how do you envision uh, leadership uh, to, to evolve within this uh, roadmap? Thank you. And sorry, Michael. Is there another question? So I thought we could uh, take one more. Okay. While others are still thinking, Michael, please. Yeah. Thanks for your question, Louis. Um, well, there's there's the question of, of 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 I guess a few types of leadership if we're thinking about it. Um, one is a leadership that is played by countries other than the great powers. Um, by countries such as Australia and Singapore, um, which have traditionally collaborated to think about the frameworks for how the region might work and, and might collaborate in a, in a stable and, and peaceful and prosperous way. Um, frameworks like ASEAN is a good example, APEC is another good e example, East Asia Summit. These are usually ideas of the smaller powers rather than the big powers. And leadership involves coming together and thinking about what sort of framework will accommodate the interests of smaller powers but be sufficiently attractive to the larger powers that everyone comes together in a consensual way to, to make them work. Um, so there's that, that sort of leadership. Once the balance is emerging, then usually the leadership is one that is generally shared among the great powers with common understandings about um, the, the importance of a power balance. Usually it, it, it relies on um, the realisation co collectively among the great powers that no one power has it within its grasp to, to actually dominate the region. And so it means that um, a self-limiting um, uh, element to leadership has to be part of it. Uh, but I think you need these two elements. I think you need those self-limiting understandings on behalf of the great powers, but also um, the, uh, the, the frameworks um, that, that are developed, the institutions that are developed by some of the smaller powers and socialise more generally um, so that, you know, that, that, that can keep the great power competition within certain bounds. Other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Michael. I'm Julius from the Center for Non-Traditional Security. Uh, it's amazing that, you know, one in every, one uh, in two Australians have uh, parents born overseas or uh, born overseas. Uh, so, how do you think multiculturalism can enhance Australia's foreign policy uh, in terms of you know a more engaged, acceptable resident power in Southeast Asia and the broader Asia Pacific region? Thank you. It's a very good question, and it's one that I've been doing a lot of thinking about at the moment um, or, or recently. I think one of the uh, one of the ways that um, Australia's changing co ethnic composition is changing Australia's politics and its role in the world is that it's weakening that old um, sort of European Australian positioning in the world. So the identification with the monarchy in, in Britain, uh, the identification with European institutions, um, the strong alliance with the United States. Um, I think that um, people who come from uh, non-European backgrounds in Australia, they see um, 
ceremonies like Anzac Day, which celebrates um, a battle that Australia fought in in the First World War in Europe, I think they see them as sort of, sort of quaint um, historical things, but they're not investing very heavily in them. And I think as Australia's composition continues to change, you'll start to see these sorts of things um, become much weaker. Um, I've yet to see any sort of opinion polling, but I think that um, when we had the voice referendum last year on a voice to parliament for Indigenous Australians, many of the electorates that voted most heavily in favour of the voice uh, were strong, were, had strongly multicultural um, memberships as well. So that, that sense of, of, um, uh, of Australia as a multicultural society accepting of all. The last thing I would observe is that prior to the May 2022 election, uh, the, the former government um, decided that it would use quite vigorous rhetoric against China as a, as a way of distinguishing itself from its opponent and um, making itself seem strong on national security. And there is quite strong evidence from uh, the disaggregated electoral re results that this tactic backfired for them. They lost very key seats uh, that had long been held by the Liberal Party in metropolitan areas, particularly in the three largest cities, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. And there was a strong correlation of uh, Asian background people living in those electorates. So there was a big swing against the government over that. Um, and uh, I think that should have sent to the coalition a very strong signal that when you start playing games like this, it could well blow up in your face. So I see very positive signs in all of those sort of data points. <coughs> Any more questions from this side, maybe? Yes, please. Um, <coughs> you first, yes. Dr. Alex Arifianto from NSIS. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the role of uh, university as a, uh, a, a, as a form of uh, soft power. Mm -hmm. And as you know, uh, many, uh, many Southeast Asian students are studying in Australia, and there is also uh, a lot of uh, uh, Australians historically do the exchange program in this region as well. But uh, uh, as we spoke uh, as, uh, during the Q&A last time, we talked about the challenges like the lack of priorities, uh, the declining, declining source of funding. I know that uh, there is this uh, white paper that, that the Albanese government just released on the future of uh, Australian universities. What is the place for Southeast Asia and uh, uh, in, in this uh, white paper? Are, are there going to be more encouragement for Southeast Asian students to come to Australia? The short answer is yes. So um, universities play an incredibly important role in the story that I've just told. Um, the the um, Southeast Asian and South Asian students who came to study in Australia in the 1950s and 1960s as part of the Colombo Plan and other, other schemes um, changed Australian society. They, they really put the nail in the coffin of uh, the white Australia policy because suddenly white Australians um, were often welcoming um, Asian students to, to live in their homes and they realised that there was no great existential danger, you know, that, that, that Australia could... could much, be much more embracing of, of the people um, in, in the regions around it. And, uh, and since then, we've seen uh, the continued um, flow of students, mainly towards Australia. It would be good to see more Australian students flowing into Southeast Asia. And I think uh, that's something that universities, but also the Australian government, really need to ramp up. We've got the new Colombo plan, which sees... Um, Australian students coming here to Singapore and to other places in Asia to study, but I think we could be doing more. But 
there is a really strong appetite for more educational exchanges, and I think they will continue to be trans transformational. Um, where, wherever I go in Southeast Asia, uh, or Northeast Asia for that matter, um, I make sure that I do alumni events, and the alumni events are always extremely well attended by incredibly impressive people, and the affection they have for Australia and for the University of Melbourne is palpable. So I think these things should not be thought of uh, or, or they should not be uh, made too small a, a, a thing about because I think they are incredibly important. Mary? Anne-Marie uh, Anne Schleich, RSIS. Coming back to hard power, uh, you very briefly only touched on the AUKUS, the AUKUS pact with the US and a non-regional power, the UK. Uh, the AUKUS definitely will and has already created uh, facts and certainly a commitment by the Australian government in a couple of hundred mil million uh, US dollars uh, that will be spread over the next 20 to 25 years. And AUKUS will have a definite impact on policies. Could you comment on that? And uh, maybe also on my special subject are the Pacific Island countries. And uh, I know for a fact that a lot of the Pacific Island countries and the governments do not favor AUKUS for various reasons. They often refer to the Rarotonga Treaty, uh, which actually was signed by Australia as well, uh, forbids uh, nuclear powered uh, ships in that part of the world. So I'd be grateful if you could comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Um, my sense is that AUKUS is, uh, I'm, I'm, you probably t can tell by the way I spoke about it, I'm sceptical about AUKUS. I'm sceptical on two, two grounds. I'm sceptical that Australia actually needs nuclear powered submarines. Um, and I'm sceptical that Australia can actually operate and maintain nuclear powered submarines. This is not, this is, I've been told I'm not a specialist in this area. This is more complex technology than actual, you know, space technology. This is very difficult to operate, very difficult to maintain. Uh, the ability for, uh, Australia currently has six Collins class conventional submarines. We can't keep all of them or even a sufficient number of them in the water at the moment. We can't staff them, we can't crew them properly. The, the thought that we will be doing that with much bigger, much more complex, uh, requiring many more crew nuclear submarines is something that I, I'm very sceptical about. The other point that my former colleague Hugh White made in a recent article is that by some point in the mid to late 2030s, Australia will be operating three different types of submarine. The conventional Collins class submarine, which is being extended in its lifetime, the Virginia class US submarine and a British made AUKUS submarine. We struggle to maintain one type of conventional submarine. How are we going to maintain three types of submarine? So I'm deeply skeptical. The last point I will say is that my understanding is that if, if developments in satellite surveillance technology move in the right direction, nuclear submarines will be easily detectable and therefore largely strategically irrelevant by some time in the 2030s. I think Australia is gambling, making a very, very big gamble here on, on AUKUS. Um, I do think that, um, as implied in your question, AUKUS takes Australia's security challenge and divorces it from Australia's diplomatic and foreign policy uh, milieu. I, I don't think we should uh, take the concerns of our neighbours in the Pacific or in Southeast Asia lightly. I think we should very seriously consider those. So um, the last thing I will say is that I think that I, I worry that AUKUS will become a big distraction in Australia's foreign relations, that we will spend all of our time justifying it, um, framing our thinking through AUKUS, uh, 
And that means that we spend less time doing the hard work of thinking about Australia's environment, I its, its general kind of strategic and diplomatic context and what we should be doing about that. We have a question at the back. Uh, my name is Dipendra Randhava. I'm with R uh, RSIS. Uh, just to continue on the theme you were alluding to earlier, um, there's, a sense br there's a broad sense across Southeast Asia that engaging with the Accord and AUKUS sort of Australia kind of glanced over, glanced past ASEAN. And uh, it, in a sense, it also seems to have undermined the notion of ASEAN centrality and how ASEAN pro fits in. Uh, could you talk about um, how you would navigate through these the, the, these issues? I mean, they've, after all, the closest neighbors are across Southeast uh, Asia. And the second point you raised earlier was about how the economic imperative seems to have influenced election results. So could you talk about some of the debates that are going on on the security alliances vis-a-vis the uh, economic imperatives that um, are quite influential in shaping uh, Australia's prosperity and prospects. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, look, I think that the easiest way to answer the first part of your question is to say that um, since Australia's sort of changed attitude towards China, as I said in the, my remarks, I think uh, chi China and, and what to do about China has become almost the sole lens through which Australia sees the rest of the world. And quite frankly, Australia finds itself much more drawn to countries that feel in similar ways towards China as it does. And I think that's the, that's the key impulse towards the Quad. Australia is comforted that countries like Japan and India uh, are speaking openly about the threat from China and are taking openly confrontational stances. It provides Australia with a sense of comfort. Where Australia is less comfortable is with countries, um, particularly in this part of the world, but not only, that refuse to take a more confrontational stance towards China. I think, I think Australians are genuinely mystified, or many Australian policymakers are genuinely mystified by how countries in Southeast Asia can be concerned about China, concerned about its behaviour, but not calling out China, not appearing to, to exercise this rhetorical kind of calling out of China as, as it is. And so Australia doesn't quite know what to do with that. And I would, I would say that, you know, the big challenge for Australia is working that through starting to decenter china from the center of our f of our foreign policy vision and thinking about how to reestablish forms of understanding and common common values with our neighbors in southeast asia on the security versus economic side of things it's quite interesting australia in the period in which it's relations with China has, have deteriorated, has continued to trade very strongly with China. In fact, the thing that continues to keep the Australian economy out of recession is China's demand for Australia's iron ore and the high prices that Australia is able to charge for iron ore and energy exports. Without that, we would have been tipped into recession, no question about it. And so, even through those, that period of China's leveraging of economic um, coercion against Australia, um, its restrictions on Australian exports of everything from coal through to lobsters, the interesting thing was that Australia didn't blink and it had no discernible economic effect on Australia. For most of those products, Australia found alternative markets and so it was a comprehensive own goal on China's part. China is now unravelling those, um, those uh, uh, measures, having gained no concession from Australia whatsoever. And so that, I think, has also had an effect on the Australian psyche. Uh, 
that if, if we're attentive to the security side of things, the economics will look after itself. And I think that is a dangerous assumption to continue to make. Because in this part of the world, of course, economics and security, as in all parts of the world, are deeply intertwined. And so I think that's another area of psychological um, digestion that has to work its way through the Australian system. Um, okay, we have two hands here um, at the back, please, and then you. Uh, I'm T.H. Chien, I'm from the private sectors. Uh, can I ask you a very sensi sensitive question? Lately, there has been some uh, uh, talk about uh, politicians in Australia being sold to the Chinese. Can you tell us, they didn't mention names, but they say somebody very, very prominent. Can you kindly brief us what is happening there? Okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe we ask the other question as well, please. Yeah. Hi, my name is Charles. Uh, no affiliations. My first question was actually similar to what is what he was going to ask. Um, second question is about uh, OS eight. I don't think that was really covered in your um, speech. So I was just wondering your thoughts on how OS eight. Um, yeah, your thoughts on how OS8 has, you know, I think in the last 10 years it's, the budget has gone down, if I'm not wrong, and there were changes under the Abbott government. Um, so how do you see OS8 mm, aiding Australia's role in, in Indo-Pacific? And the last question is a bit more on domestic politics. Um, in the last election there was a TU wave yeah. um, and a lot more uh, cross ventures. How do you see that affecting the, I guess, how do you see the domestic politics playing out in the foreign uh, policy role of Australia? Thank you. Thanks, all great questions. To the first one, um, in a nutshell, I don't know. Um, it, it's, uh, it's something that the ASIO Director General announced, but he has provided no details whatsoever. Um, I think it's entirely possible. Um, it, I, I think his intentions in raising that question were to make people more attentive to the um, operation of foreign influence in, in Australia, as, as I'm sure there is in all countries as well. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm afraid I just can't answer any more than that because I just don't know. There's been lots of speculation uh, in the Australian media, as you would expect, but, uh, but I, I, can, I can add nothing to that, I'm afraid. Um, AusAid, um, well, AusAid doesn't exist anymore. Uh, AusAid was uh, absorbed into Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as one of Tony Abbott's first acts as Prime Minister. Um, and I think it was a catastrophic mistake. And I'm on the record as advocating that the current government reverse that. I don't think they will. Why is it a mistake? Because um, the figures show that uh, the, the merger led to the departure of a very, very large number of staff, particularly senior staff, with deep development expertise. And the loss of that sort of expertise is absolutely catastrophic because it means that Australian aid policy, um, I wouldn't say it's directionless, but it doesn't have that strong framing that it once had and it isn't connected as it once was into global discussions of development effectiveness. And development effectiveness is hard, it's difficult. It's very rare that developed countries get it right and having them share their views and refine their frameworks together is necessary and I think Australia has lost that capability. So there's, there's two deficits in Australia's aid policy. One is a, a money deficit and you're right, um, the aid, uh, Australia's aid levels are at historical all-time lows. Um, but there's also an expertise deficit as well. Um, one of the things that you, you cannot do with aid, in my view, is to tie it too explicitly to foreign policy objectives. There has to be an altruistic element in aid, otherwise aid doesn't work. 
uh, and, aid, uh, and aid does not serve diplomatic goals, let alone developmental goals. I think so much of Australia's challenge in the Pacific and Southeast Asia um, that it faces today, uh, it, it faces because of uh, short-sighted decisions relating to the Australian development aid uh, framework and budget. Um, uh, I'm not sure if they, if, they, if they can be retrieved, to be honest, um, but I do worry about it and I, I continue to urge the current government to think about establishing a separate development aid capability. On the TEALs, um, I think the development of independence in the Australian Parliament is one of the most positive things that has happened domestically in Australia. The major political parties are increasingly polarised. They're increasingly risk averse in terms of policy reform. They're increasingly focused on gaining power and keeping power. Um, they, uh, I think, are increasingly divorced from uh, the views of ordinary Australian people. Um, I was listening to um, three of the Teal independents. Um, for those of you who um, aren't aware of Australian politics, I should quickly explain. Uh, in the last election in Australia in May 2022, I think there are about six or nine safe Liberal, Liber Liberal Party held seats that were won by um, independent members of parliament, all of them professional women um, who would once have been members of the Liberal Party. So it, 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 it was a profound uh, repudiation of the Liberal Party in some of their inner city uh, affluent electorates. I heard three of them debating tax policy on the radio the other morning and it was the most enlightening, um, uplifting discussion I've heard between politicians on Australian radio and it's because they weren't scoring partisan points and they weren't uh, giving non-answers to questions because they thought the other side would attack them for it. So I'm a big supporter of the growth of independence in the Australian Parliament. Uh, I think it's a very good thing and I hope it leads to a more sort of civilised and mature Australian politics. How will it inform foreign policy? All of these teals have sophisticated views on foreign policy. I'm sure that more of them uh, gaining parliamentary seats will lead to a more sophisticated discussion of foreign policy in Australia. We have one, yes please, one in front. Any others? Hi, I'm Jenny Vaz and I'm a business consultant. My question really it's more to cybercrime. And you know, scams in both countries, they've exceeded billions, you know, in the billion dollar mark. How do you think, the, uh, recently they, just, um, they released a, a, a new summary saying that there's been a 55 point dossier as a result of the summit. How do you think the countries can collaborate to tackle this? Hold that, Michael, because there are two of, I see a number of hands being raised now that we only have about 15 minutes. Yes, at the back. And then I see two here. Yeah, please. Gordon. Ah, sorry. I don't know whether you're, I got your name right, but please go ahead. It's fine. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. My name's Kevin. I'm an Kevin. associate research fellow of RSIS in the U.S. program. Uh, my question has to do with Australia's trade agreements. So Australia is a member of the CPTPP, of RCEP. It has a digital economy agreement with Singapore. It's been pretty active on the trade front. So the first part of my question, I'd like to ask, how does this, uh, this, this, net, this frame, these uh, many frameworks and Australia signing up to them kind of factor into Australia's strategy? And secondly, um, Australia, I believe the government has said that it won't oppose China's membership in the CPP, CPTPP, but it wouldn't really advocate for it either. So I was curious to, if, to know if you have any insights into how it will kind of manage between uh, China and Taiwan's uh, bids to join the CPTPP as well. Thank you. Okay. Michael? The last two we will come late uh, after this uh, response, please. Uh, look, I'm really sorry. Cybercrime is not an area of special specialisation for me. I'm sure um, more international collaboration between governments is better than less. 
but that's about the level of my expertise. I'm really, I really apologise. Um, so, so the 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 question on on trade is an interesting one. The first point I will make is that studies have shown in Australia that Australia's trade agreements have very low or relatively low levels of, of eff efficacy. What that means is that businesses uh, pay very little attention to trade agreements that, Austra that the Australian government signs. They, they don't take advantage of the advantages that trade agreements provide them, which goes to two factors. One is the need for the Australian government to communicate much better with business about the opportunities, but it also tends to be that Australian business is relatively um, uh, risk averse when it comes to investing particularly in the Asian region. And it's one of the things that the Australian government does worry about. And so much of its economic strategy for Southeast Asia that was launched in Jakarta last year is about trying to trying to progress that even further. I'll give you a I'll give you a statistic. Australia has more investment in New Zealand, a country of five million people, than it has in Indonesia, a country of three hundred and fifty million people. So it shows you the imbalance of the way that Australian businesses think about. Um, in terms of um, China, advocating for China's membership, my, my understanding is the Australian government has said it will advocate for no access to China until China dismantles all of its, it, all of its trade blocks against Australia, uh, which I think is a, is a very sensible policy. But I think, you, you're right, I think Australia will be agnostic uh, it will probably leave, leave it to uh, members like Canada to oppose China's um, uh, accession while being fairly quiet itself. On Taiwan, it'll probably do the same thing. Thank you. We have uh, the lady uh, in front, and there's one more at the side. Yeah. Microphone, please, on this side. Hi, I'm Emily Follett, Acting High Commissioner of Australia. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of um, things, Michael, that you um, said and, and perhaps challenge them. I think there was a, a, a lot of great stuff in what you shared, but um, the idea that uh, China is the sole lens through which Australia sees the world, I think, is is a oversimplistic um, uh, view of Australian foreign policy, and I think particularly in, in light of the um, ASEAN Australia Summit held earlier this week, I think was one of many examples of the very central role that Australia sees for ASEAN in the region um, and our shared interests with those ASEAN countries. And I just wanted, I guess, in that context also pick up one of the comments that I did agree with, um, which was that the uh, uh, around Australia's growing multiculturalism and the idea that um, that brings us closer to the region and helps Australians appreciate more our commonality with our neighbours in the region, not only in terms of at a individual level, but also our interests um, as, a, as a region. And I think our, our foreign minister said it well when she said, you know, when we look out to the world, or I might paraphrase and say, when we look out to the region, we see ourselves in it. Um, I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on, as we look out to, to the countries of ASEAN now, I think we see more and more in the context of so many complexities in, in the world, mm -hmm. um, so many threats to peace and, and so forth, we see not only ourselves in the region, but a bucket of common interests um, as small and middle powers in the region with, with our friends in ASEAN. And I just wonder if you can reflect a little bit on that ASEAN-Australia relationship um, and how you see the value of that for all of us um, going forward. Thank you. Okay. And find the, the guy in the center. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, my name is Wilson, uh, alumnus of RSIS. 
Um, two questions for you, Michael. Uh, first, uh, to bring back to your earlier discussion on the lack of roadmap in Australia's foreign policy, um, to add on to your earlier observation that you know there were about, about seven leaders in the last 15 years, um, I also observed that Australia, you know, you have elections every three years. Doesn't this create systemic risk with regard to any sort of development and implementation of foreign policy? And do you think Australia will ever be able to mitigate that risk? And second, um, that on China, because this seems to be really everyone's favorite topic, uh, beyond the softer rhetoric and Albanese's uh, visit to China, do you think like, it, it occurs to me that Australia does remain quite hawkish um, in its position against China. Do you think there's any sort of meaningful room for dialogue and any sort of confidence or trust building between both sides? Please. So um, on, um, on the, the, the Australia-ASEAN relationship, I think, I think this is a very important relationship to both sides. Uh, and it was demonstrated uh, quite clearly in Melbourne this week. Um, I think that the formation of ASEAN in 1967 was one of the most important strategic developments in Australia's foreign policy history. Um, it, it, it took a region that had been plagued by instability um, and, uh, and, and, you know, plagued by un underdevelopment and created what we, what we see today. And I don't think we should underestimate that. And I think that's, that's widely um, appreciated in Australia. <coughs> I, think, uh, I think by the same token, um, I've been really quite interested to hear the warmth with which Southeast Asian leaders have talked about the relationship with Australia. More than, more than one um, in private and I think some in public have said um, Australia is in many ways ASEAN's most important dialogue partner um, because um, what's really become clear to me is that Australia is seen as a major external stabiliser while ASEAN is under all sorts of pressure from, from other directions. But I do think that Australia could actually increase its ambitions in Southeast Asia. I think the economic report is a good place to start. It is a problem that trade and investment is underdone both ways. But there's more to Southeast Asia than that. And Southeast Asia itself faces significant problems of, of instability, the problem of Myanmar, the ongoing issue in the South China Sea. All of that is, is really important. And I think Australia can play a, a really important, though probably understated, way, uh, understated role in, in really helping to invest in its relations with Southeast Asia. Um, so on China, uh, my sense is that the Australia-China relationship will never go back to where it was 10 years ago um, in which um, there was a vision for Australia and China as strategic partners. There was a close, cordial relationship. Uh, President Xi Jinping uh, addressed the Australian Parliament in 2014, I think it was. Um, that will never happen again. Um, I would be surprised if we see an, a, a Chinese president go to Australia again. I could be wrong. Um, the Albanese government has stabilised things. It's, it's put things back on a more pragmatic path. But I think relations between Australia and China probably on that pragmatic level are about as good as they will get. Um, there, maintain, there, there remains a major lack of trust in China uh, among both sides, both sides of politics in Australia. Um, there is alarm that uh, China is um, seeking to, to change the regional order. In Prime Minister Albanese's speech to the Lowy Institute recently, he made the very clear statement uh, that China is not a status quo power. And, uh, and Australia is, is worried about what that means. It, uh, I think Australia worries that the United States under Donald Trump will withdraw from the region or become less committed to the region. And it worries about what the consequences of that are for, for China's growing influence in the region. I don't think there's any, well, maybe parts of, of the opposition in Australia, but I don't think there's many people 
who believe that China would physically attack Australia. But I think there is worry about what China would do in terms of its expectations of a country like Australia's compliance with what, with what China wants. And to, to live in a, in a region in which smaller countries are expected to be just compliant with what Beijing thinks they should be doing, I think is a future that, that should worry all of us. So I, I, th I think dialogue will continue. I think some forms of dialogue will resume. But bringing, the, bringing back that level of uh, cordiality that once was there, I think, is a thing of the past. Any more questions? OK, we have about five minutes. So let me exercise my prerogative, Michael. You've been very kind talking about ASEAN. And we don't have to be very kind about ASEAN because we are ourselves are thinking about how best we can help ASEAN. Um, and you talk a lot about the importance of institutions and the thing about community building. And picking up on what the um, Australian Deputy uh, Commissioner have said, but w w if you were to once again be advising or be uh, you know, going back to Lowe and say, how else can we get ASEAN and Australia to work together, because ASEAN obviously has a lot of things going for it, but, of, but there, there are things that it could do better, and maybe in what it could do better is something that I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, look, Melly, I, 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 if, if I was foreign minister, um, which I will never be, um, uh, what I would want is for Australia and ASEAN or at least maybe a subset of ASEAN countries, maybe the original ASEAN Five or something like that, uh, really elevate their discussion about the region's future. Mm. Um, what uh, I read through the communique that came out of the Australia ASEAN Summit, and there's lots of great ideas in there, um, but they're kind of, I would call them relatively low level ideas. They're good ideas, they'll, they'll, they'll move things forward a little bit here and a little bit there, but they won't transform the Australia-ASEAN relationship. What would be transforming is to start to convene a strategic dialogue with ASEAN, to think about what the, 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 the region's future might look like, what might be some of the scenarios involved, um, how Australia's vision, or Penny Wong's vision, of a balance of power in, in Asia um, might be similar or different to the long-held ASEAN preference for omnibalancing, for involving all, all um, great powers in the region, rather than choosing one or the other. Working out where the nuances and where the differences are, and whether there is, as I said in, the, in my remarks, a roadmap for what the smaller countries of the region might start to do together to move the region collectively in that direction. My reading of, of Penny Wong's uh, remarks, particularly her press club address uh, from last July, I think it was, was that she talks about a balance of power, but there seems to be an assumption in her remark remarks that all we can do is kind of hope for a balance of power to emerge through the wisdom of the great powers. Um, I think we can do better than that. And I think that Australia's natural partners in doing that are here in ASEAN. Thank you. Well, uh, <coughs> unless there are any more questions, I, I um, wanted to thank you again, Michael, for uh, a very, very interesting and very fascinating uh, discussion about Australia's uh, role in the region, how it sits itself. As you mentioned, as Australia has been the oldest dialogue partner of ASEAN, 50 years. And um, I, I, you know, if, if here is Australia that was once upon a time, you know, irritated a lot of countries in the region for its sheriff, you know, sheriff's role, right? Was it the sheriff of Asia or something <laughs> like that? Sorry. Deputy Sheriff of Asia. And yet here you are just talking about you know, working together with small countries.
And in this part of the world, we've always thought that we are not just price takers, that countries in the region actually have agency. And I think that agency that you're talking about, exercising that and working together with a middle power like Australia is really something that we should chew on. Um, our uh, ambassador is part of the vision group that will unveil ASEAN's vision 2020, um, ambassador 2026, <laughs> 20 years. 10 years and 20 years, and I think ideas like this are useful in getting, uh, you know, pulling up your sleeves and thinking what are what we really did not have to do. Uh, I don't have to tell everyone. We all know that we have a different environment now. Uh, you talk about a, a different, um, you know, a different generation in Australia, but with that different generation also having to deal with a different environment, mm -hmm. and the expectations are of course different. And this, I guess, will go a long way in shaping how we deal with each other. So thank you. And it leaves me now to join the rest of the audience, join us, the audience, to join me in showing our appreciation to Professor Michael Wesley.